Exodus and then to look closely at how that related to your life. Because I spent time in talking about how when we look at Moses and we look at Gideon and we look at Jeremiah or Peter and Paul, that we tend to see these God-like men. And yet in reality, that distorts the value of their story. And last week as we talked about Moses' call, you know, we, we said, said we've been talking on the education team about Maybe it's how we were raised in a church or whatever it is. And some of us had a real good opportunity. Like last week I talked about Moses. Well, we seem to be real good at teaching our kids about Moses and the burning bush. Wow, that's really cool. Well, that is a cool story. And, 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 and it really is. And, or, or the little baby of Moses in a basket. And his, his mother was protecting it. And she made the basket. And she wrapped it in tar. She had it in tar so it wouldn't get wet. And she put it where it could be found so the baby would have a good opportunity in life. And that's a great story. But for many of us, then, we reach back, particularly our young folks who, who I have here. They go, okay, that's wonderful. So what's that do for me in 2016? And some of the older folks go, oh. What do you mean? It's Moses. Yeah. And the kids are going, so? I didn't know him. And yet some of the adults are going to say anything, but we don't have the courage to say it like they do. That's why I like hanging out with them, because they, because they, because they tell me exactly what, what, what kind of stuff is like going on. So our challenge is how do we make that story relevant to 26, 26, 16? And part of it is Moses was born to a mommy and a daddy who were real people. Moses was a real person. Today we're going to talk about Gideon as a real person. That's why I challenge you to go back and reread these things and follow them and look at one, take the scripture apart, look at it academically as a narrative, which is what we're calling it for those who major in English and have all that stuff down. You know what a narrative is and, and, and how it fits into, into your life. Well, uh, today, we're going to talk about Gideon, and Gideon, besides, as I said last week, besides being that guy that we know that goes around to hotels and leaves Bibles in all the doors, you know, um, uh, that, that may be the only way that, 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 that we know him. In fact, or we pick up the paper or hear on the news that there are now people who want to stop Gideon from going around to all the hotels and putting Bibles in, in all the doors. The only thing I want to ask Gideon is, give me something other than the King James. Sorry. For those who love the King James, that's great. I prefer something else. But it's better than nothing. Now, for those who don't know, Gideon really isn't going around and putting put those in. It's a society. And it's a group that chose Gideon's name. Does anyone know why they chose Gideon's name? I don't. I didn't. I've got a better idea now that I've prepped for this. Because now I think I know a little bit more who Gideon is besides, oh, he's Gideon. His mother gave him a really weird name. Because what we're going to learn is Gideon's call contains the same five components that Moses called it, which means that there's a good chance that our call is coming the same way. Now, you know what Gideon is? Gideon's actually mentioned in the New Testament. He's mentioned in the book of Hebrews. And I don't know if you knew, but being a sports guy, as you guys know, I know, I know, I know, I know, man, there are Hall of Fames in sports. We like to have a Hall of Fame. If you're a rock and roll fan, there's a Hall of Fame in Cleveland for rock and roll. There's a Hall of Fame for almost everything. Did you know there's a Hall of Fame for faith? That's actually what it's called. It's a nickname to this section in Hebrews that, that, that Paul starts writing about all of these people who showed great faith. And it's nicknamed in study groups the Bible Hall of Fame for Faith. Gideon is mentioned in the New Testament in that Hall of Fame. So you go, wow, so Gideon was a faithful man. So that makes him godly again. And we lose the reality. Well, let's come to a little reality. First, we said that the call narratives that God does five things, according to Dennis Pratt, the, uh, the uh, Bradshaw, from Point Loma University, Nazarene, which Jill's all excited because she knew right where it was, has relatives who I'm uh, gave it a name and donated all the money or something. I don't know. <laughs> and and so 
The first step was that, that, that Bradshaw says God always confronts us. He confronted Moses. He confronts Gideon. Now, usually, that seems to be at a time when you least want it. Moses was confronted in a time when he wanted. Gideon gets confronted, we'll, we'll hear in a minute, at a time when he didn't want it. It'd be sort of like if you were a CPA, Mo, that the God would show up on April the 10th and say, hey, Mr. Ms. 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 Tax, uh, a, the, 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 the accountant, I have a job for, 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 for you. And you're going, but I'm working 19 hours a day now. That, well, okay, but I'll take you through it. Well, Gideon in Judges 6, we heard this morning, in verses 11 to 13, to 13, we read where God confronts him. And listen to this. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abyssalite, where his son, that was his son, Gideon, was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, Understand, a wine press, big hole dug in the ground, or a big barrel that was made. For many of us, we remember the barrel. For those of us who are old enough to remember, I love Lucy. Lucy, you can remember? Yeah, so immediately you see it, a lot of us old folks, that Ethel and Lucy are in stomping grapes in this big pit. All right? Well, he's in there threshing wheat. Now, for those of you who don't farm, that means he's taking the wheat, he's beating it on the ground, hitting it with a stick to get the seeds to come off so he can throw away the plant part and save the seeds. That's what he's trying to do. Why is he doing it down in a wine press? All right? Well, there's a, re there's, there's a reason it says he was threshing the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, they had just been in war, and the Midianites were pretty tough dudes. That was a pretty good bunch of men, and... He realized that not only were they going to come in and steal their food, but they'd probably kill everybody who was, who, was, who was around. So he's hiding in the wine press, so hopefully no one would know he was there. All right? So then in verse 12, he's in there, he's threshing the wheat, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Oh, uh, kiss up time. The angel's coming in, he's going to, yeah, you know. Sort of like I said last week, sort of like what the DS called me a couple of weeks ago and says, Fred, we'd like you to take a new assignment, and you know what? You're just the, and you wanted, yeah, okay, great, yeah, there was, yeah. So the angel Paul spoke up for a for, kid, and says, you're a mighty warrior, because he was, he, he was actually good, it, it, it wasn't just that, but he tried to pardon me. And, and Gideon says, pardon me, my lord, but if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? <laughs> Where are all his wonders that our ancestors had told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. I just spent time last night and this morning, and both times it came up, that I true and I answered this, I truly believe the number one question that I get, and I bet that you get from your non-believer friends or borderline believer friends, is if there's a God, then why fill in the blank? If there's a God, then why is there child abuse? If there's a God, why? In Wesley this morning, I found out after 21, one, one, one years of one of our, our, our Christians is now unemployed, her company moved to Pennsylvania. Of course, people in Pennsylvania are saying, Wow, after 21 years, we finally have a company and a job. But for many of us, it's these awful things in life that we're saying, if there's a God, then why? Well, we think we're the first generation to do that. I hate to break it to you, but Judges was written a few generations ago. And what is Gideon saying? He said, if you're the angel of the Lord, and you're coming to talk to me, and I'm a mighty warrior and all that, yeah, okay, I got you. He says, pardon me, but if that has happened, then why is all this going on? Where are all his wonders that his ancestors have said about? He is challenging just like people today are. If this wasn't written for 2016, I don't know what was. That's the greatest thing that's coming, particularly for our younger folks, the, 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 the uh, millennials and our young folks are coming up, the world is telling you, well, if there was really a God, then nobody would hate you. Nobody would bully you in school. 
Nobody would make fun of you because of this. I mean, my gosh, so we've been doing race relations for how many years? So if there was a God, then why did it all fix? He fixed it on a cross. We've chosen otherwise. Gideon is us. That's, that's my point here. Second part of the call, God confronts you, and then he tells you what, a, what, he, what he wants you to do. He uh, commissions you. In verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have. Those are important words. I'm going to come back to them. Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Now, that's actually even a little bit of the fourth point, which is assurance. But he sends Gideon with the strength he has. Do you remember this, when we talked about Moses a week ago? He sent Moses to go do something, and Moses goes, yeah, but, but my speech is bad. I, I have a speech of of that. I, I, I don't do this. I'm, I'm 80 years old. I mean, you know, he had all the excuses in the, in, uh, the world. And, and in this case, it's almost like God's just not going to give Gideon a chance. He says, take the strength that you have. I don't want, yeah, I know. I know that you're not perfect. I know that you're not good at this. Take what you got and use it. Folks, that's the message. Your call, narrative, means I'm taking you where you are as you are. If you're a hard-headed, little, funny hairdo guy who, who, was a, who, who was an athlete and a coach, and you think you want to be a preacher, then guess what? Go. And you go, but I don't think I'll go. I'm with you. He's telling you the same thing. So that's what he tells Gideon. And we can learn that from Gideon. Then right away in verse 15, we get the best part. We say we're best at it. We said that is the objection. But, but God, no. But, but, but. And Gideon does the same thing. He says, pardon me, Lord. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in all Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. So God goes, big breath, I'm sure, and he says, you must have not heard that last thing. I am in verse 14. I am not sending. Am I not sending you? So he says in 16, the Lord answers, I will be with you. That's all you need. We don't buy that any more than Gideon did. Oh, but it's got to be more to it, that Lord. And God said, no, I'll be with you. I'll get you through whatever it is. You, you, you may not like the battle along the way, but I'm going to get you through it. And then he follows up, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites. I mean, the meanest dudes in town. You're going to strike them all down and leave none of them alive. Fifth part is when we say, but Lord, if you're really God, show me. Prove it. Give me a sign. And we talk last, 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 last of the time, but that we get signs, but we look back and we go, but I want a better sign. I'm not really sure that's, that's, that, that's going to be you. Well, guess what? Gideon, if you don't identify with Gideon today, let me tell you what, then obviously you're not like him, which could be a good thing. So in verse 17 to 24, then Gideon, he replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign. So, okay. That, that, that is you who's really talking to me. I'm sorry, you're down in a wine press, slapping wheat against the ground, and there's an angel standing there beside you talking to you. Do you understand what he's telling God? He says, yeah, I'm talking to an, an angel. But I'm not sure. If this is really you, then this is what I want you to do. Right, yeah. Okay. He says, please, and, and, and now it makes sense. He said, hey, God, wait a minute, though. Wait a minute. He's telling God to wait. Please do not go away till I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait for you to return. Now, what's important here is you go, well, why is he bringing a sacrifice? Well, if this is Yahweh, then Yahweh only responds to sacrifices, is what many Hebrews thought. So he had to bring grain, and he had to bring meat, and it had to be, they had to build an altar, and it had to be burned on the altar a certain way, and if that was the case, and the angel still spoke to him, then he would know. He'd done everything he could. This was, as I said weeks ago, good item. This was Yahweh. All right? So he goes home. 
He goes back to his home, Gideon goes inside, prepares a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, that's a measure of flour, he made bread and yeast. Putting the meat in the basket, and it's brought to the pot, he brought them out and offered them to him, to, 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 to the angel of God, under the, under the oak. And the angel of God said to Gideon, take the meat and the unleavened bread and place it on this rock. Pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Now, Gideon's got to be wondering, okay, I'm off the hook because there's no altar here. There's no fire built. We're not going to be able to burn this. It's not going to work. All right? So I'm listening to a false god. And the angel then touched the meat and the unleavened bread and the tip of the staff in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming all the meat and the bread. And then the angel of the Lord disappeared. And Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord. He explained, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Uh-oh. Remember last week? What happens when you see the face of God or the angel of the Lord face, said, uh, face to face? You're going to die. Well, God beats him to the punch again. And he says, he, and, and, and he says, I've seen him face to face at the end, but the Lord says, Peace. Do not be afraid. Chill out. Relax. Chillax. Whatever it is. So Gideon then built, he said, you are not going to die. Whew, okay. But I still got to do that Midianite thing? Oh, gosh. So Gideon built an altar of the Lord there and called it the Lord is peace, and to this day it still stands. So Bradshaw writes that the task does not depend on the leader's ability. We talked about that last, 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 last week. But on the leader depending on God. It is the leader going in the name of God and God's power at work through him or her that brings success. All of these dimensions of commissioning narratives or call their narratives are part of our life. That's, that's where we are. You know, I told you that Gideon had a couple of other opportunities that he challenged God. Don't, don't think it was, that, it was that easy. There were actually three times Gideon asked for signs. You heard the first one. The second one, he took a fleece, that's a piece of lambskin, got the skin and it's still, still got the wool on it, and he said, he, he went in, he brought it out, and he laid it down. And he says, Lord, okay, I need another sign. That, that other thing was really cool, you know, the burning the stuff up, that was really cool. But I want you to do this one, all right? If you're really God, he said, I'm going to put this fleece, fleece, this fleece here. When I wake up in the morning, I want there to be dew. I want, I want you to bring dew and settle it on the fleece, but nowhere else. Everything else has to be dry. Gideon wakes up in the morning, and guess what? Everything's dry, touches the fleece, the fleece is covered in dew. Still don't think Gideon's real? Or just an average guy? Hey, God, that was really cool, too. The fire thing and, the, and that thing. But here, I got one more for you. For you. I'm going to put the police out again tonight, but this time, I want you to put dew on everything else, but not on the police. You know what? Can you, can you imagine if you were God? Just want to just want to punch you once. You know? Just once. You know? And he goes, okay, I'm going to do that again. Because he knew that Gideon's weakness, his weakness was lack of faith. Believe it or not, ends up in the Faith Hall of Fame, but his weakness was faith. He wakes up the next morning, and guess what? Fleece is completely dry, and everything around it's covered, it's covered, it's covered, it's covered, and Gideon goes off about his business. His business was to go conquer the Midianites. So he gathered together thousands of men, and he's going to go whip some rear end. And God goes, you know, that's too many. By now, Gideon has all the faith. He goes, okay, God, what? And so God reduces the number. We won't go through all the, de we'll go through all the details of that. And that wasn't good enough. And he wants it even fewer. In fact, the last command, I get this. This is one I just got to throw it for him. Got to give it out there. He sends them down to drink water at the pond or the lake or whatever. And he says, you can only take the ones who lap it like a dog. Oh, those are the guys I want. Yeah. <laughs> of course, as a football coach, that's probably the guys you do want. You know, the real athletes. But those are the guys who want. He gets 300 men to go conquer the Midianites. He's charged to go right in their encampment in the middle of the night, and all he takes is a spear in each hand, and they get a clay jar with a torch inside. Because God has told them when they get there, they're going to yell and scream and sound like a whole bunch of folks, and then they're going to bust the jar, and they're going to look at 300 torches, hear all these voices, and it's going to sound like more people than what it is, and you are going to whip the meanest men in town. Right. Gideon Howe has faith, and he, and he believes. Sure enough, it all happened. The Midianites went out the back door and gone. 
that's the message. From a man with so little faith that he asked God for three different signs and all the challenges in life. He was the youngest, Moses was the oldest. Here we have, this is it. What is your desire? That's the difference. What is your desire? Their desire was to serve the Lord, and it came in an unusual way for both of them. So is your greatest desire money? Is it health? Is it family? Is it success? Greatest desire. Or is your greatest desire to love God by loving the Lord Jesus? Because that is what we were created for. That's the image of God in which you are created. And until that becomes our focus, then we're probably going to miss all the details of that call. We cannot respond as Moses and Gideon did if we do not desire to serve the Lord. It has got to be more than punching the time clock on Sunday morning at church. We truly have to want to serve. God doesn't take second. He doesn't take runner-up. He doesn't take part-time. He's full-time, and that's the deal. And when Moses and Gideon got it, thousands and thousands of years since, there's some little dude in a white robe talking to people about how important their lives are. Wow. So the big question is, God's asking, hey guys, can you hear me now? Can, can, can you hear me now? Because that's our focus. We've got to hear him to be able to follow through. We come today, one of the greatest opportunities that we have is 